Hello lovelies, this video is the next in the series on our videos on respiration. In this one we are looking at the details of the oxidative phosphorylation part of the process. If you want the whole process, if you want everything in respiration, everything in photosynthesis, then you can go and check out the playlist or you can go and check out the webpage where everything is linked for you or you can go over to my website, sign up to my mailing list and download the checklist which links through to every single video in order for you. Hi everyone, okay, so this is our last respiration video. We've got to the final part. Before we get to the final part, because this whole part is about producing large amounts of ATP, let's have a quick reminder and recap of ATP and its structure. We have a nitrogenous base, the adenine, we have a ribose sugar, and then we have three phosphate molecules joined in series. This structure is what makes ATP technically a type of nucleotide. So it has a nitrogenous base, it has a ribose sugar, and it has multiple phosphates. And remember, it is known as ATP triphosphate because it has three phosphates. It's often known as or referred to the energy currency because like money, it is exchanged for uh, energy requiring processes. It's produced in respiration, it's produced in photosynthesis. We mustn't forget that, but obviously we're focusing on respiration in this video. It can easily be broken down and then remade. So it can be broken down where it's needed to release that energy for energy requiring processes like active transport, building of molecules, but it can also then be remade quite easily. And we're going to talk about how that happens. And that's why it's useful as this energy molecule, this energy currency. It's made by the enzyme ATP synthase using ADP. So that's uh, two phosphates and then adding that inorganic phosphate on to make it ATP. And in respiration, this is the part where we're going to get to, we're talking about oxidative phosphorylation, where we're going to make the majority of ATP that is produced from respiration. And most of that happens in the final stages in the membrane, in the folds of the inner membrane of the crystal. And that's where we make most of the ATP produced through chemiosmosis, which we've already covered in photosynthesis. These are the steps of oxidative phosphorylation, which is the chemiosmosis part, okay? And it takes place in this intermembrane space that is between outer membrane of mitochondria and the inner membrane, which is folded. So I've got a section of that inner membrane here, and then at the top, you can see I've got my intermembrane space, and at the bottom is the matrix. So we're going either side of this inner membrane inside my mitochondria. So this is obviously going to be very similar to exactly the same process of chemiosmosis that took place in photosynthesis that we've already covered. We're just talking about slightly different names for membranes, but other than that, it's basically identical. So the electron carrier proteins are found in the inner membrane and they oxidize the reduced coenzymes NAD and FAD when they arrive. Remember, oxidation is loss. So they are giving up their protons and electrons. They are going to therefore reduce those transport proteins, uh, carrier proteins that are in the membrane. The electrons then pass down the electron transport chain, so from protein to protein, through that series of redox reactions. So they leave one, they join another one, and as they leave, the uh, protein is oxidized, and as they join the next one, that protein is reduced. So it's a series of redox reactions, and they move down. As they're moving along, the energy is being lost from them because each one of these proteins is at a lower energy level. So they lose energy as they go. And that energy is being used by these proteins to actively pump hydrogen ions into the intermembrane of space. So you can see I've got those red arrows there on all of those proteins that are then actively transporting those hydrogen ions across the membrane from the matrix across the inner membrane into the intermembrane space. So this causes a concentration gradient to be formed because the hydrogen ions are going to accumulate in the intermembrane space because the inner membrane is permeable to the H plus ions. They can't just diffuse back through except through the protein channel ATP synthase we're going to talk about in a second. So we've got this electrochemical gradient because we've got high positive charge on one side, low positive charge on the other side because we've created this high concentration of H plus ions outside uh, in the intermembrane space, and we've got a low concentration of H plus ions in the matrix. So as I said, the H plus ions can only diffuse down their concentration gradient 
through the channel that's in ATP synthase. And that flow, that movement of H plus ions through ATP synthase helps to catalyze the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP, which we've already talked about. So this is how the majority of ATP is made. And you'll notice that obviously the reduced NAD and the reduced FAD, they obviously are bringing protons and electrons. So because there's so many reduced NAD and FAD coming and bringing all of those hydrogen ions and electrons, they are what the more hydrogen ions and electrons we have, the more ATP we're going to be able to make. The other thing that you'll notice is that the FAD uh, goes and delivers its electrons and hydrogen ions to the second protein in the electron transport chain, not the first one. And because it starts a bit further up the chain, the electrons give off less energy as they move along because they don't go through as many um, energy level drops. And so uh, FAD is often referred to as um, the coenzyme that provides slightly less ATP. And we will discuss how that works in a second. When you talk about oxygen, we haven't mentioned oxygen or water, which are obviously two parts of our respiration equation that we haven't looked at yet. So in respiration, we always say, obviously for aerobic respiration, we need oxygen. Why? Oxygen is needed in this part of respiration as the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. So once those electrons have moved through all of those proteins in the electron transport chain, they have to go somewhere. If they don't have anywhere to go, then they wouldn't be able to move through this process at all. Oxygen needs to be there to accept that final electron and use some of those hydrogen ions that are free in the matrix to combine together to make water. So there we have, we have our oxygen becoming water, so we have one of our reactants and one of our products of respiration. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase. It's sometimes labeled on diagrams like this and you'll see it towards the end where the reaction with oxygen and the electrons is happening. Happening. And it's important to kind of note that here is that if we didn't have any oxygen or if this transport part, so if there's no oxygen, if there's no final electron acceptor in this, this transfer of electrons to oxygen to make water, that doesn't happen, then there is no movement of electrons along the electron transport chain. There would be no energy to pump the hydrogen ions, so there would be no ATP production or it would be dramatically reduced. Example questions that can come up about this include things like respiratory inhibitors. And there's lots of different ways that poisons or toxins or things can be used to inhibit or stop respiration. But cyanide is one of the examples that actually inhibits the electron transport chain. So it's a type of poison, it affects the electron transport chain and it actually stops the cytochrome oxidase enzymes from catalyzing that reaction. So it stops oxygen from being the final electron acceptor, which therefore stops and inhibits the flow of electrons in the electron transport chain, which means that no ATP is produced. And if there's no ATP, there's no energy, and therefore cells start dying, and that's why it's a poison. So it's one of those things to think about parts, all the parts of this respiration and process that we've talked about and all the stages, at what point could something be stopped or inhibited that would prevent the process from carrying on and so there's different types of inhibitors but one of those is cyanide and it might talk about stopping the final electron acceptor or it's also why obviously if we don't if we don't have enough oxygen it can become a problem because we can't make any atp so think about that when you answer some of those more slightly more difficult application questions in theory the total potential yield from respiration for one molecule of glucose would be 38 atp because for every molecule of NAD that arrives at the electron transport chain, three ATP would be produced through the ATP synthase. And for every molecule of FAD that arrives, two ATP would be reduced, produced from ATP synthase. And I said that's due to the amount of um, energy they provide in terms of how many hydrogen ions they can actively pump across because of how much energy is lost when they deliver those electrons. And because FAD arrives slightly um, after, further along the electron transport chain, Less energy is released from its electrons, so less hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane, therefore less can flow back down to make ATP. If this says in theory, this is because it's not always achieved. It's not a 100% efficient process because some energy, some ATP is used at some points in the process. So it's used to transport ADP from the cytoplasm to the matrix. So the ADP can't get into the mitochondria on its own. It's used to transport pyruvate into the matrix, and we talked about how some of the ATP from glycolysis could be used to do that because the pyruvate cannot get into the uh, mitochondria on its own. 
and also to transport ATP from the matrix into the cytoplasm to then be used by the cell. So there's no point making a load of um, ATP in your mitochondria if it can't then get out back out to the cell where it's going to be needed for processes. So because all in all, in actually to get this ATP to be useful and to actually get things from A to B in the stages, we need to use some ATP. We don't make as much as in theory we could do. So what does that look like? In actual, what we say then is that in actual net production is that 2.5 ATP is produced for every reduced NAD and 1.5 ATP is produced for every reduced FAD that arrives at the electron transport chain. So you can add it all up and sum it up and prove that in total we get about 32 ATP because in glycolysis we produce two reduced NAD, in the link reaction we produce two reduced NAD, and in the Krebs cycle we produce six reduced NAD per glucose molecule, and if you times that by their energy values and how much ATP they can produce, and same for FAD, and then remember that we also produce two ATP in glycolysis and we also produce two ATP in the Krebs cycle. If you add all that up, it gives us 32 ATP. And you need to be able to show and demonstrate how you can add that up. You might have to be asked to add it up on a diagram. You might be asked to just show the calculations about how it works out. But you need to be able to explain where this ATP comes from and how we calculate that total. So that's it. That's respiration in a nutshell. We've gone from glycolysis through to the link reaction, through to the Krebs cycle, and then finally through to oxidative phosphorylation. And remember, that just means adding a phosphate in the presence of oxygen, which it is doing that, <laughs> or it needs oxygen to do that. Okay, so hopefully that was useful. And now we're going to move on to looking at how energy, in terms of the energy that we're making in, and energy in organisms, transfers through larger systems like uh, an ecosystem, a food chain, and some uh, nutrient cycles as well. Ouch! This is why in some videos I like playing scratches. <laughs>